Good morning and welcome to today's webinar, National and Regional Perspectives, hosted by the Maryland Department of Planning in partnership with the Maryland Department of Transportation. My name is Jill Lemke and I serve as the Manager of Infrastructure and Development at the Maryland Department of Planning. The Maryland Departments of Planning and Transportation work closely and in partnership to advance transportation and land use planning with the goal of supporting vibrant communities, promoting safe transportation options, and connecting all Marylanders to opportunities and each other. This walk in our series, taking place every Thursday in October, is part of a larger webinar series produced by the Maryland Department of Planning, featuring a variety of smart growth and planning related topics. This webinar is being recorded and will be posted, <coughs> excuse me, along with past webinars for viewing via the Maryland Department of Planning YouTube channel. The Planning Department's website provides other valuable information on statewide planning initiatives, planning tools, and educational opportunities at planning.maryland.gov. We encourage you to visit the website and to subscribe to our e-newsletter to learn more about our upcoming programs. For more information on Walktober and related activities, please visit the Maryland Department of Transportation's website, where you can also find various Walktober videos and registration links for future webinars. Viewers of this live event are eligible to receive one and a half CM credits from the American Planning Association. To receive AICP credits, visit the APA website, planning.org, then log into your account and search for the name of today's event. You can also search for event number 927-7203. It is important to note that the views expressed by the speakers today are those of the speaker and not necessarily those of the Maryland Department of Planning, the Department of Transportation, or the State of Maryland. Before we introduce our speakers, we have a short welcome video from MDOT's Assistant Secretary for Public Affairs and Strategy. Good morning. I'm Joanna Green, Assistant Secretary of Public Affairs and Strategy. Thank you for being here today as we celebrate Maryland's fourth annual Walktober, a month-long series of activities and educational events to promote safe walking and walkability. To learn more about Walktober and to find resources and events happening throughout the month, please visit our website. Following the success of the previous years, we're pleased to continue hosting a series of four webinars or walkinars, as we call them, each Thursday throughout the month. These walkinars highlight innovative practices to support walking and walkability and provide important information on safety, equity, health, and infrastructure. To that end, here at MDOT, we are excited to announce the launch of our Sidewalk Data Inventory Collaboration Project, which will evaluate the feasibility of statewide sidewalk data inventory. Pedestrian access statewide to transit centers, major activity centers, and other locations that individuals seek to travel to and from is an essential part of creating an equitable, accessible region for everyone. Sidewalks are an important part of MDOT's new bicycle and pedestrian master plan, as well as the complete streets policy. Today's Walkinar will cover new efforts and perspectives on walking and pedestrian safety at the national and state levels, where we are and how we move forward. We'll hear from Mike McGinn, Executive Director of America Walks, and Mike Watson, Director of Livable Communities at AARP. I'm looking forward to today's event. Thank you for joining us and enjoy the presentation. Thank you, Assistant Secretary Green. And now it is my pleasure to introduce our speakers. Mike McGinn got his start in local politics as a neighborhood activist pushing for walkability. From there, he founded a nonprofit focused on sustainable and equitable growth and then became mayor of Seattle. He has always worked to add new voices to city decision-making and has gained deep insights into how influence has gained and wielded to make change. Just before joining America Walks, Mike worked to help beat first Washington's States walking advocacy organization, expand their sphere of influence across Washington state. 
He has worked on numerous public education, legislative, ballot measure, and election campaigns, adding to his abiding faith in the power of organizing and volunteers to create change. His many years advocating for sustainable cities and environmental justice give him the perspective for expanding America Walks partnerships. Mike Watson is the Director of Livable Communities at AARP, where he is the Enterprise Lead for Livable Communities, working with AARP's 53 state offices to encourage towns, cities, counties, and rural areas to be more livable for people of all ages. He leads AARP's teams responsible for programs that reach over 1,100 locations, including AARP Network of age-friendly states and communities, directs technical assistance resources, free award-winning publications, and resources and livability grants to communities nationwide through the AARP Community Challenge Grant Program. He holds a bachelor's degree from Wingate University, a master's in public policy from the University of Maryland School of Public Policy and a professional certificate in municipal finance from the University of Chicago Harris School of Public Policy. Mike lives in Annapolis, Maryland with his wife, an elementary school teacher and two daughters. He is an avid runner, cyclist and youth lacrosse coach. Following their presentations, our speakers will answer as many questions as time permits. You can submit a question at any time by using the questions tool located in the control panel on the right side of your screen. For administrative or technical questions, please use the chat function. And with that, I'll turn it over to Mike McGinn. Welcome, Mike, and thank you for joining us today. Right, unmuting. Oh, here we go. I'm on. Thank you. And I hope the screen is showing america walks somebody gives me a thumbs up of the yes um <clears throat> so hi i'm mike mcginn executive director of america walks and we are um, a national organization focused on walkability and we support our mission is to support local advocacy for walkable accessible and equitable places um, and also to be a voice for walkability at the national level now, there's a lot of reasons that walkability is great. I'm not gonna go into all of them. And those reasons include um, health, safety, access to jobs and opportunity, um, climate resilience, uh, climate, reducing climate emissions. Um, the benefits are, are just fabulous. And what we see is groups around the country pursuing it for various reasons. But I wanna focus on one in particular first. And that issue is safety. What we know is that pedestrian deaths have been climbing over the last number of years. And the last full uh, set of data we have from 2022 shows that it's the most pedestrian deaths since 1981. They're rising faster than all other fatalities. Um, and not only are they rising faster than others, the number of pedestrian fatalities in comparison to vehicle miles traveled is going up. So we have a pedestrian safety crisis in this country. And we're unique in this regard. Um, all, you know, if we look at Europe, and this, this, this slide's a little hard to see, but what we see is that in European countries, the pedestrian, uh, well, road, roadway deaths overall there have been declining, whereas in the United States, they've been increasing. And I think if we compare ourselves to Europeans, I think we can agree that um, they probably drink, they're probably inattentive, they have cell phones, uh, they suffer from the pandemic. Um, they have all of the same factors affecting their behavior that we do, um, except I think there are a couple of notable differences, and we're going to get into both of those. And one of those is how our streets are designed, and the other is the increasing size of American vehicles. So I also need to point out that, that the impact of pedestrian fatalities falls much harder on Black and African American communities and Native American communities than it does on the rest of us also falls more on lower income people. 
And it's probably because um, they, these demographics may walk more, but they're also the infrastructure in those communities is less safe. So what is uh, one more thing and speed. Again, I know many of you have seen this before, but what we know is that a person hit at 20 miles per hour um, has a very good chance of surviving the collision, but also a, a chance of death, but at 40 miles an hour, there's almost no chance of surviving. So the issues of how we design our roads and the way in which our roads are, you know, favor uh, speed and don't favor safety is, is really critical. By the way, these stats are based on, you know, were developed before our vehicles have been getting so much bigger. And of course, electric vehicles, as great as they are at reducing pollution, also tend to be heavier because of the, of the batteries in them. Um, so where do the deaths occur? This is, uh, by the way, these slides I've been showing you have been from the Governor's Highway Safety Organization. They are uh, have great data. I recommend it to you to check in on. They've also been from Transportation from America's Dangerous by Design report, um, who are fabulous partners um, with many organizations in this work. Where does it happen? Non-freeway arterials, as opposed to interstates and freeways, where pedestrians are banned, right? But we still see um, we still see that number, um, and collectors in local streets. And the difference is when we say a non-freeway arterial, I think you all know what we're talking about. It's that roadway that's built with multiple lanes, it's designed for high speeds, and it has few crossings, um, tempting people to cross in places that aren't safe. Um, but oftentimes the crosswalks themselves aren't safe because of the high speeds. Um, and the danger here is that what we have done is brought highway design principles into communities where people are present. And we have prioritized the movement of vehicles over the movement of people. And it became deeply embedded in engineering standards and has led to a built environment that's hostile to people outside of vehicles. Um, this is a, a I invite this is from our own website, our blog. Uh, Don Kostelek is an engineer in Idaho. And this was an example he shared of his inability to get a crosswalk um, from where he is standing, taking that photo. Behind him are a bunch of houses. And the closest store for things like eggs or milk or, or snacks is that convenience store at the uh, Chevron. And there's no safe crosswalk for a long distance in either direction, and so people cross. He could not get a crosswalk from the State Highway Department approved because, in their opinion, not enough people crossed. And believe it or not, the standards governing roadways, the other way you get one, is how many people have died. So not enough people had died yet to get a crosswalk. That's something called the Manual of Uniform Traffic Control Devices. It's being revised, and one of the things that us and other advocates are looking for is, are we going to make it easier to get crosswalks, or are we going to continue to view crosswalks as an impediment to the movement of vehicles? Um, there's so many ways this movement of vehicles is embedded in our systems. This is just a Google screenshot, and if you look at that guardrail, you know, it's there because the engineers understand that a car might leave the roadway and plunge off that hill. Um, so it's built to prevent a car from going over. That's not designed to prevent a person from falling down that hill. But what's between the guardrail and the, and the roadway? Um, a pedestrian, a, a sidewalk. And this is what engineers call the clear zone. They try to leave an open clear zone so that cars can sway out, out of the lane and then recover. Um, so they anticipate that pedestrians might be there, but this is where we build the sidewalk. It, here's another example of how the engineers anticipate that people are gonna leave the roadway. Um, if you know what this was for, you would never sit here. This is a bus stop, a bench at a bus stop. And what it's pointing to is the fact that the pole is built with breakaway nuts. So basically, the engineers who designed the street are anticipating that a car might leave the roadway and hit a pole. Um, 
So yeah, but the person sitting in that bench is not valued as much as the damage that might occur to the vehicle. Similarly here, you know, the plastic posts we see to mark, mark roadways, see all that grease? On the, the, that's the grease from the underside of vehicles. Again, you know, what do we value in this roadway here? The safety of the person in the bike lane or on the sidewalk or the, the, the vehicle? So deeply embedded in our systems. So what do we do to get at this and the other issues? And uh, I'll, I'll walk you through these really quickly. Um, first of all, this week, October 2nd through 8th, we have the National Week Without Driving. It's targeted towards elected officials and agency officials and members of the public because we want them to understand the challenges that non-drivers face, which is you know 30% of the population, whether due to age, ability, um, income, or, or choice. We have over... Uh, 250 elected officials nationwide, dozens of organizations participating. Um, if, you, if you didn't get a chance to jump in this year, check it out, join us next year. It's really fabulous at helping um, decision makers understand the challenges of non-drivers. We have uh, our walking college, which trains people on how to be better advocates. We've also partnered with AARP provide state level walking colleges and we partner will be partnering with them in the future on other training programs to help teach uh, local people and, and support local people in their work to make their community safer. We have community change grants. These are modest grants, but they help uh, catalyze action in the community. They're open right now. In fact, we're going to extend the deadline a week. So if you can take a look at it, we hope the application process isn't too complicated. Um, if you're looking to, uh, you know, particularly for community groups looking to get some money to make make a little change in their community, we have webinars like uh, like the one here, and uh, you know, join us. We got some great topics. I also want to call out one of our other great partners, uh, the Centers for Disease Control and the Active People Healthy Nation program. They support um, all of the three programs I just mentioned before. And what's really great about them is they are looking at how do we not just encourage people to change their behavior, um, which we've been doing for decades with limited effect, but how do we change the systems that people live in? And so we're going to start talking about that a little bit. Uh, by the way, I'm not going to go through these slides, but the reason they care is because diseases of inactivity are an extremely important public health issue. They have fabulous resources on the Active People Healthy Nation site about it. I, I recommend it to you, and it's, you know, public health, CDC approved information. Um, so here's some of the things we, we work on. And, you know, we're looking at the state of walkability. Hopefully, we're working on the most important things. So I, I think I'm going to cover the right ground here. One of our focuses is what we call building better streets. Um, and that is that support for local advocates, that's all the public education we do, but we also have something called the Intersections Initiative, and uh, that's in partnership with the League of American Bicyclists and the Safe Routes Partnership. And there is, as you know, tremendous amount of money from the federal government going into infrastructure right now. There's a number of specialized grants that are targeted on safe routes and uh, uh, to, to schools and parks. Um, or, or the types of projects that America Walks and the League and the Safe Routes Partnership loves. I also want to say there's also tremendous amounts of dollars going to state DOTs, and 70% of the infrastructure bill uh, for 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 transportation is what is called flexible funds, and states actually have a tremendous amount of discretion about how they spend that. Now, historically, states have spent that on highways, but they have the capacity to flex that towards, um, they have the capacity to flex that towards transit, they have the capacity to support uh, local roadway projects. Uh, there's a lot they can do with it. Um, and, but you might find in your work that you'll talk to your, high, your highway, uh, your state uh, Department of Transportation, and they'll tell you they don't have money for your type of project. Um, 
our nickname internally for the intersections initiative is the don't let them bs you program they do have money if they're telling you they don't have money what they're telling you is that they are choosing to spend it somewhere else so our goal is to help support those that are getting uh, developing better projects and getting those projects into the funding stream whether from specialized grants or from the dollars that are already being raised by states or received by states for transportation generally. Um, here's you know, a small example. Um, this is uh, from my own neighborhood. When I said I got involved in getting sidewalks, this was a street without sidewalks. We can get sidewalks. It just makes places so much better. Um, but this took me years to do. Um, and I was told repeatedly that there was no money for this. Um, but with organizing, we managed to do this. As mayor, I went to too many of these memorials of people that were killed on our streets. There are ways to change streets. This is the street. This was the intersection. Um, you can see that there are very, it's a, it's a neighborhood arterial, but it's kind of sort of two lanes because nobody parks on it. It's not well uh, designed, even though it says a school speed limit of 20. Cars were regularly going very fast. Just paint, narrowing the lanes, putting in a bike lane, creating turn pockets um, made a huge difference. Um, we've, we can see this in other parts of Seattle where we've done this as well. It is not that expensive to make these changes, although it can be controversial. But what we know is that the speeds go down, the collisions go down, and the injuries go down. Um, and this is a choice that does not require a massive expenditure to, to achieve. I think I've been talking about street design and better streets, slowing the cars. But the other thing that I think is really important to walkability is getting to the point where we have places that support walkability, community design. And I chose this image because for too long in America, we have chosen to separate all of our uses from each other. The retail in one place, the offices in another, the housing in another, and, and even institutions are separated. The schools or the hospitals are all separated. If we look at this street, a traditional street, um, there's retail. We don't know what those second and third floors are, but they might be housing, they might be offices. Everything's in close proximity, built before parking minimums. Um, this is an example of the way in which our modern street typology separates people. This is, these are both to the same scale. How far, how, you know, what's within a one mile reach? The street grid, you've got a lot of reach. The cul-de-sac design, not so much. And that really presents a challenge for us. The other thing in that is that purple is the, is the retail. Or, or office, again, and these are also distant. And I'm sure you can look at your own community and identify those spots. Um, I did, I just, uh, this is Maryland. I was doing a presentation in, in uh, St. Mary's County. And I just went and, and went in on a, on a Google, uh, Google view, uh, Google Maps view, and just randomly put a, a pin in at the end of one cul-de-sac and another pin in at the end of another cul-de-sac, which are pretty darn close to each other, right? Backyards abutting. How long would it take to walk from one to the other? 52 minutes, it's 2.4 miles. We actually designed our places to make them impossible to walk. Um, and I think that's part of the challenge. People look at this and say, how can we change it? And it will take you know, a really focused effort to do that. Um, by the way, the difference in the design of places and how it affects walkability is huge. This is from uh, Larry Frank, Urban Design for Health. Highly recommend looking at their materials. If uh, you want someone to analyze planning in your area, they can tell you some really amazing things. And what we know is the more walkable a place is, the more people walk. Now, that doesn't tell you that much, but also their health improves. So first of all, um, a somewhat walkable place, you see a 20% increase in walking. A walkable place, you see a 45% increase in walking based on car dependent or somewhat car dependent uh, land use types. Stress goes down the more walkable it is. 
Diabetes goes down the more walkable it is. The sense of community goes up. Boy, isn't that something we could use right now? A little more sense of community. So I know that that can seem challenging, right? Because we have a lot of places that look like this. Um, and this is, uh, again, my neighborhood project I worked on uh, before I was mayor. Um, typical box, you know, box store, a uh, big parking lot. But the property owner decided to thicken it up a little, put in a, a drive and walkways and housing on what was previously a parking lot. This is the next block over. It was a McDonald's with a parking lot. Now it's Moore Street, just stretching all the way back. Um, we put 50 years of investment into making unwalkable places. We've got to start thinking about how the next set of investments uh, build these types of places where people can live, have uh, affordable choices, um, and be close to uh, uses, uh, be able to get around with walking and transit. Um, it used to be how we build places as a matter of course. Um, so it means we have to clean up our land use codes and support these types of investments. Um, another program we support is reconnecting communities. A big focus on this is uh, freeways that divide communities. This is the inner loop in Rochester before, and there's the inner loop in Rochester after. Um, those, those different sides are now not separated by a moat, and we have more land for parks, open space, um, or for housing um, uh, to build a more complete community here. Um, and making it much better for transit and people walking, biking, or using an assistive device. Um, we support freedom to move. Um, we've supported uh, decriminalizing jaywalking to prevent kind of the social obstacles to be people being able to move in their community without being uh, accosted or stopped because of their uh, race or religion or gender. And, uh, next big issue, of course, is safer vehicles for pedestrians. Cars are getting bigger. The front ends are getting more dangerous. Visibility from the driver's uh, seat is getting worse. And um, that is another big difference between us and places that see pedestrian deaths going down. So we have worked with a host of others to push for federal regulation for testing vehicles for their safety to pedestrians and for requiring in federal motor vehicles safety standards, um, the types of changes that would make vehicles safer. And we've also started seeing some communities uh, start enacting weight-based fees for car registrations to try to get at the fact that the vehicles are getting larger and more dangerous. Um, we and others helped uh, generate uh, 16,000 comments to Pete Buttigieg to over, overhaul vehicle safety, and we've been seeing some movement in that regard. I, I'm sharing this picture because this was a lot of people made fun of this vehicle when it was first proposed, but you can design a big vehicle to have good visibility from the driver's seat and incorporate other types of safety features um, that will make it uh, much less deadly to pedestrians. Um, this is another campaign we're pushing. We call, uh, we call it our Safer Fleets Challenge. But in Europe, they now have something called intelligent speed assistance in all new cars. GPS can track your location, know your speed limit, and regulate the speed of your vehicle. Um, new York City has done a pilot project on some of the vehicles they own. Uh, Ventura County, California has installed it in some of their county vehicles. And the feedback to date is that it dramatically reduces speeding of uh, government-owned vehicles. The reason we're focusing on the government fleet is it may take years to get federal regulations around this, but government fleet owners can make their cars safer with, uh, with this you know, commercially available retrofit. If you wanna learn more about it, you can look up our old webinar and hear from the fleet manager of uh, Ventura County and the effect it had there. Um, so there are things we can do to make vehicles safer to pedestrians in addition to making uh, um, streets safer and to making communities more walkable. Get involved, 
you can come to our website and find uh, local walking organizations. There are so many. We are not up to date. If you want to be included, let us know. We want to steer people who want to make a difference to their local organizations. And I will close there. And uh, talking about steering people to organizations, um, the AARP's livable communities work is some of the, you know, in, in, from my observation, some of the best work in the country at bringing together community members with uh, support from uh, staff, with support from grants. I hope I'm not stealing your thunder, Mike Watson, um, in terms of, of helping generate that public demand for better communities. And uh, it's just a great program. So with that, I'll turn it over to Mike Watson. Thanks so much, Mike. Um, great, I love your presentation. Um, and for those of you who heard Mike for the first time today, which uh, I suspect is uh, probably a very small portion of you, he's an incredible presenter and had just shared a, a portion of his wealth of insights here with you today. Um, so while I'm working to get my screen up, um, I'm gonna do the awkward thing that we've been doing for several years now where you um confirm with me that you can see what's up here so i think it should be up now just confirming can you all see my screen at all yes mike we can see it fantastic all right um so really again appreciate getting to follow mike and the table setting that he did on the importance of why walkability matters. I know many of you tuning in today are probably already seized of that message. Um, and also some of the kind of what happens when we address this, right? We see decreased traffic fatalities, we see improved health outcomes and so much more. Um, I'm gonna dive in a little bit on why this matters specifically to older adults and why AARP is working in this space Mike um, just kind of did a fantastic setup of kind of um, our growing work here. So I'll talk a little bit about that and some of the resources that are available to communities to help you take action along with the incredible tools that uh, Mike and his team at America Walks offer. So to start, I think one of the things we wanna really hone in on um, is the fact that why AARP is here having this conversation. If you're not familiar with AARP, um, you're probably familiar with us as an organization that sends a lot of mail uh, when you're approaching the age of 50, or you might know us for our advocacy on um, Social Security and Medicare at the federal level and at the state level to support family caregivers and other areas of work. But we're also increasingly a local organization. Um, today, AARP has working and has kind of touch points with about a thousand communities across the country where we're working and supporting with working with partners like America Walks, working with um, organizations um, in the community, working with planners, working with transportation planners, um, working with mayors and others across the country to create places that are great for all ages. And you see on the screen, one of the reasons that motivated us to get into this work a few, uh, about, about a decade ago. You see on the screen the aging of America, and this is kind of one of those maps that everybody's probably used to seeing. Um, the one on the left is from about 10 years ago, a lot of light blue there. And then when you get to the right yet side, you see a lot of dark blue and purple, which represents the increase in the 65 plus population um, in all of those states. And as the country is aging, uh, in about 20, in 2015, we had about 10 or 10% or so of our country was over the age of 65. As we go forward to 2030, that's gonna to increase to closer to 15%. And Maryland's right in there, um, kind of tracking the national average to a degree. Some states are aging faster, some are aging slower, but every state is going to see an increase in its population. And almost every community is going to see an increase in its older population over that time period. And while that's happening, we're gonna see some really significant dates approach us here too soon. So I showed you earlier 2030. Now we see up on the screen 2034. That's when there's gonna be uh, more people over the age of 65 in this country than children under the age of 18. And that really marks a significant moment and a significant moment in this demographic shift that we've been in for the last uh, 15, 20 years or more. Um, but when we focus on these dates, we tend to kind of think about, okay, um, that, 
we're going to be there in 2034 and we're going to have more people over the age of 65. And a lot of the conversation about the aging of our country has been focused on boomers in the last 10, 15 years or so. And the boomer, baby boomer generation is big and significant and important. And their aging um, over the last, um, over their entire lives has been one of the uh, most important demographic stories. But that also leads people to think, okay, once we become an older popu an older um, country because of the aging of the boomers, it's kind of you know a one and done thing. But that's just not the case. When you look at the um, again in a few short years in 2030, we are going to have baby boomers, Gen Xers, and millennials all over the age of 50. I'm a millennial right now. I um, learned that um, I'm also what's known as an elder millennial, which means I'm on the older end of the um, millennial spectrum. And in a few years, the first of my generation is going to be 50, joining Gen Xers and the baby boomers. And um, we can all hope, as we, uh, as we have in past generations, that uh, generations that are that are here today and coming in the future will live longer. So we're not just an older country today. We're not just going to be an older country for the 2030s. We are going to be an older country in perpetuity. And that has a lot of significant um, uh, kind of implications for how we design and build our communities. So that was one reason why AARP started in this work, this aging of our country. The other is a fact that you see up on the screen, which is coupled with, despite the media narrative and stories you hear a lot about um, older adults moving and moving to Florida and Texas and Arizona and um, North Carolina, you hear, that's certainly the case for some people. But by and large, we know that people over the age of 50 want to remain in the places they live today. It's the place, these are the places where they've raised their families. It's the places where they have their friends. It's the places where their medical providers are that they've known for years. Their places of worship and more. So we, again, eight in 10 people over the age of 50 want to stay in their community as they age. And that's a very similar number when you ask people if they want to stay in their home as they age. There's a lot of factors that go into that. But as we kind of um, ask this question about what what is important to you in the future of your community we see a very similar parallel response in that um eight and ten people over the age of 50 also say that having well-maintained sidewalks is extremely or very important to them and their community and to enable them to do that um, and that is actually one of the most popular features that older adults desire in their communities is sidewalks that are that are well maintained and are going to allow them to walk to places and safely get there without um without hazards along the way so some of the statistics that mike shared earlier are quite revealing um as to that fact so while that's kind of the positive story we know our country's aging we know that um, older adults want to remain in their community and they care a lot about mobility we also know that it is not easy to do that in this country um, I won't go through all the statistics you see on the screen, but we know that when we combine our um, country's housing situation, along with kind of some of the statistics that Mike mentioned earlier with regards to mobility, um, specifically with older adults, we know that um, you know roughly 80% of people over the age of 50 today get around primarily by driving. And we also know that um, the average American is gonna outlive their ability to drive, by, to safely drive by six to 10 years. And counter that with that many people want walkable communities and are walking the, when they can't drive. Um, we see that older people over the age of 65 are overrepresented in pedestrian fatalities in 35 states. And that's compounded with some of the st statistics that Mike shared earlier. So we add these factors together, our housing situation, the challenges of mobility and public spaces, we end up with kind of um, a pretty tough place for people who are wishing to age in place. And we see increased social isolation, many of which you know the health risk of, um, you know, the health risk of prolonged isolation are equal to smoking 15 cigarettes a day. And all of these factors kind of compound in that. So with that framing, we know that these are things that are important to older adults, but they're also important to people of all ages. Mike shared some, some views, some views, statistics, and photos of that earlier showing um, older adults walking with young children. And when you actually poll um, generations across the board, having access to places, to uh, safe places where they can walk and being able to walk to something safely is consistently one of the highest rated responses 
in terms of what people are looking for in, in, a, in a community. And that crosses generations. Boomers, millennials, Gen X all feel very similarly about that. And that brings us to AARP's kind of approach is when you look at these kind of focused needs of older adults and you design a community around those needs, you're going to also build a community that is great for younger folks and great for everyone in between because we know that a lot of those same needs are needs that are felt um, with children and felt with um, people who are, you know, in kind of that middle middle age portion of life where they're raising families and more. So with that, that kind of brings us to um, what do we do to take action? Mike kind of mentioned some of the some of the programs that are available to us and some of the ways, even with uh, some fantastic pictures ways that communities have taken action. I'm going to highlight a few kind of um, things that we have seen across our network and then talk about some specific AARP resources that you can take away with you. The first is to find the common ground. We know um, bringing together people across generations to talk about the importance of walkable, safe, connected neighborhoods helps people build a shared experience and helps forge those intergenerational experiences. So in Hartford, Connecticut, they, they host open streets festivals as we do across the state of Maryland and other communities to bring together neighborhoods and bring people together to understand what that space could be if they were, um, if it was a place where they felt safe going to and walking. Another thing building on that is to bring different voices together. Um, in Seattle, Washington, a city that Mike was uh, previously the mayor of, the city held uh, a hackathon where they brought together, they called it the um, Hackathon for All Ages, and they brought together city government, issue area experts, and residents together to address persistent challenges that folks are seeing. And some of the things that bubbled to the top were solutions to address sidewalks. And the uh, city was then able to pilot with resident input and, um, and expertise from the local, from the government, um, uh, programs that will help people identify problematic intersections and then take action. Another important step is to take to start with small but tangible and real steps. We'll talk a little bit about the importance of conducting walk audits as a way to do that, but just want to highlight here in Anchorage, Alaska, where um, Bike Anchorage received a community challenge grant from AARP to conduct a temporary demonstration of a roundabout um, to just gain some public input, and they paired it with education along the way as well to do a little bit of um, kind of awareness building and of the importance of roundabouts and slowing down traffic, what it means for people and reducing uh, pedestrian fatalities, and also how it doesn't actually kind of uh, dramatically change uh, folks' ability to get from one place to another in a vehicle. Another thing that I think Mike's presentation showed really well, um, particularly when you look at the crosses and flowers uh, memorializing folks who had been struck by vehicles is drawing attention to the problem in a very clear way. Here we have a picture of a Another um, community challenge grantee where Propel Atlanta, along with ARP Georgia and other partners, work to raise visibility about locations where pedestrians have been struck and killed by vehicles to draw attention to the unsafe conditions there and hopefully um, uh, kind of incentivize action. And then finally for us, it's about celebrating wins and building on them. Um, we know, as Mike shared, kind of his story of um, bringing about change in his neighborhood. That took a number of steps over multiple years. So it's important when there are wins for the community to be involved, for organizations who are kind of at the forefront of that or are representing the community to be part of it, to celebrate that, and then continue to build upon that momentum by layering on that. I'll give you an example here in Austin. The, um, the city and nonprofit organizations work to do um, healthy and slow streets during COVID-19. Um, when that program is going to wind down, uh, community partners in AARP Texas work to kind of get it, make it a permanent program for the city to continue to do and, and to continue to ensure it's activated. They're hosting walk on it and weekly walking clubs on these streets as well. So I'll very quickly touch on um, how AARP supports change. I'm going to dive into a few of those areas real quick and then really looking forward to hearing, um, hearing questions from everybody. The first way that we do, as Mike mentioned, is through um, providing, or one way that we do is providing grant funding um, to organizations. We have a program called the AARP Community Challenge that has awarded um, over 16 million to 1,400 grants since 2017, um, leading to hundreds of crosswalk improvements, bike lanes, and more. We've funded bike infrastructure in Annapolis, safe crosswalks in Baltimore, um, new bus shelters in uh, Glen Burnie, and other areas of the state as well. We also work to advance policy. 
So with technical support and through our state offices, we've been able to pass, help support passage of nearly 100 state and local policy changes across the country that are going to focus on uh, transportation in public spaces since, since uh, 2021. And then finally, we have um, online tools and training, such as our ARP Walk Audit Toolkit that can be downloaded for folks to go out and conduct walk audits on their own and take action. And then, as Mike mentioned, we also partner with America Walks on state walking colleges, which have trained since 2021 over 160 walkability advocates and champions who are all taking action across the country today. And again, uh, as Mike alluded to, a lot more exciting stuff to come there, which we're really, um, really looking forward to happening. And then finally, we have a um, ARP is uh, the um, U.S. affiliate for the ARP network of age-friendly states and communities. There's roughly 800 communities across the country that are taking action today, and nine in 10 of them have identified priority actions to improve walkability. So real quick, I just want to touch on this tool, the ARP Walk Audit Toolkit. It's available at aarp.org slash walkaudit. The um, publication itself, along with 20 different worksheets that enable local residents, organizations, and local governments to go out and identify, collect data, and um, kind of um, quantifiable data, as well as kind of that um, you know, human experiential data on unsafe intersections and identify places um, where improvements are needed. It's available in English and Spanish. Um, again, this kind of gives you a little bit more of a detail of the substance of it, um, but it's really designed for people to go out and identify places where improvements are needed in their community. And then finally, I'll highlight uh, two final resources. I mentioned the AARP Community Challenge. We've been able to pilot some really exciting partnerships with America Walks this year where we deliver um, smaller grants of about $2,500, paired up with technical assistance and training from Mike and his team to fund walk audits and support action across the country to improve walkability. The next application window is going to open in January of 2024, so I hope you'll stay tuned there um, to aarp.org slash livable. And then finally, I mentioned the AARP network of age-friendly states and communities. There's about 800 communities across the country that are part of this, including about a dozen in Maryland. We're there, we're working kind of on a holistic framework over the course of several years to identify community needs, take action on them, and then implement changes. So with that, really looking forward to taking your questions and just direct you if you, um, all of the resources and everything I mentioned today are available on AARP's Livable Communities site, aarp.org slash livable. So thank you again. And now, Francine, I think I kick it back to you for Q&A. I think that's to me, Mike. Thank you. Uh, thank you to Mike and Mike. The presentations were definitely informative. And um, we apologize for the early technical difficulties. Um, throughout the webinar, we've been assembling questions from our audience, but you can continue submitting questions during the discussion. We will get to as many as we can until 12 p.m. Eastern time. So we will get started. Um, if our presenters could turn on their cameras so uh, we can see you, that would be fabulous. Um, First question is from Clark Larson, who asks, do you know of any research into the benefits of um, benefits or upsides to lane repurposing as transit bike or sidewalks as a counterpoint to concerns about increased traffic? Um, hey, Mike McGinn, I'm not sure if you want to take that one first and then I can add on. Yeah, sure. I think what we tend to, yes, there is a lot of data out there and a lot of experience in this. This is off the top of my head. I'd encourage somebody to go double check this. But basically, the city of Seattle, for example, did the four to three conversion, you know, two travel lanes each way. By the way, those are just the most dangerous roads because somebody in the curb lane stops and somebody else swerves around them. And that's extremely dangerous. So you get one lane each way, center turn lane, and that often leaves uh, room for a bike lane on each side too. What we have found is that on roads that, you know, with 22,000 vehicles a day or less, or 25, people have gone even higher, there is no impact on vehicle throughput. The same number of vehicles move through. 
um, one lane each way and the turn lanes is actually much more sane and reasonable and makes for a better driving experience too. Because with the two lane each way, what you get is somebody moves to take a left turn out. And so the person, you know, uh, in the left lane goes to the right lane. And then there's somebody in the right lane taking the right turn. So they swerve back to the left lane. So you get a lot more sw side swipe collisions and car to car collisions as well as uh, car to person uh, collisions. So it's, it's just a, a less stressful, better experience. You can see that the delays are often measured in seconds. And something to remember on, on, on streets, on many streets, it's not the number of lanes that determine how fast you can go. It's, it's the uh, lights at the intersection that determine how long your trip is gonna take. So it's really the, um, yeah, being able to speed from light to light does not shorten your trip, but makes it a lot less safe. So very, very many streets. We way overbuilt our streets um, with, with lanes that are too wide and with too many lanes. And uh, there's, again, the data out there is that there's virtually no impact on throughput or speed. Yeah, and I would just add on to, I know that there's been, um, I don't have them off the top of my head, but there has been some good research done on when you slow people down and when you create spaces for people to walk and bike through a community at a more leisurely play, pace, the economic benefits of that are, are kind of uh, stated and documented as well. So that might be another um another point to consider as you're making the case for these types of changes uh, yeah undoubtedly true and and also you know it as you all know it it takes even the the, the smallest fender bender will eat up all of those seconds you saved racing down that roadway mm -hmm. and worse so it's it, there's no way that the, that it's more efficient to have more deaths injuries and collisions um in terms of using our roadways well said. Yes, thank you. Um, next question. Um, what can planning professionals do about the increasing vehicle sizes? Um, the two worlds don't seem to have a natural interface. And is there any relationship between the increasing amount of screens built into vehicles and the number of crashes due to um, taking the attention away from the road? You know, I, I, want, I would, first of all, you know, vehicles are regulated at the federal level. So that creates some challenges and, and the federal regulatory process is slow. Having said that, um, the NHTSA, National Highway Tra Traffic Safety Administration, is proposing safety ratings of vehicles for those outside of vehicles. We, we push them to make them stronger. Um, they were going to make it a separate pass fail and put it on a website. We want it to be integrated into the safety ratings and shown at the point of sale. We also wanted them to consider size and weight and visibility um, in measuring that. So, so there is a federal regulatory response as well as incorporating things into the safety standards could make vehicles safer. As I mentioned earlier, we have seen some cities and states start looking at weight-based fees and you know there'll be more opportunity for that because the gas tax is declining as a source of revenue with fuel efficiency and electrification. So we're going to see states looking for more revenue, and weight-based fees would be fabulous as a way to you know capture that. Um, there's the wear and tear on the roads as well as the you know deaths and injuries. And part of the reason, if if you are a planner or you are in public health or you are in government encourage uh, your local fleet owner and or the elected officials who oversee those fleet owners to use their buying power to put safe vehicles on the streets. They don't have to wait for federal regulators. They can, they can choose vehicles that have all the latest safety features. They can choose to install intelligent speed assistance. Uh, we saw, you know, as mayor, I saw fleets competing to be the greenest when I was mayor. It's time for government fleets to start competing to be the safest. And I think that that type of buying power and example setting um, can help build public acceptance of the technology and ultimate regulation in that regard. 
I think Mike answered that question really well. I'll just add on to one point that he just made at the end around public acceptance, which I mean, there's potentially an education component here as well. You mentioned kind of the number of screens in cars as well. So ARP has a program called ARP Driver Safety. And we added a component about seven years ago as vehicle technology, um, technology within vehicles became much more uh, prevalent um, to kind of uh, do some education and allow older adults to join live and during the pandemic virtual sessions to learn a little bit more about the technology features within their car, how to use them, how to use the backup camera, how to be aware of what lane assist means and all of these things. Um, so there is kind of a personal education component um, on the issues that Mike talked about, as well as just kind of um, educating folks who we know um, are on the road today um, and are kind of um, uh, dealing with the vehicles that are on the road today. So that's another piece that I think is helpful is educating the public and working, um, working with partners to probably do that. Great. Thank you. Um, another question we have is um, asking if you could provide some successful examples of intersection initiatives in cities or communities um, in this particular person's community. The Department of Transportation uses no budget as a reason for not doing additional analysis and designs for complete streets. Well, one of the things is there that one of the things that is being provided from the federal government are grants to do planning. So that's also part of what's being offered. Um, and we do recognize that there are some challenges with even you know, mustering the resources to put together a grant application for, for planning. Um, but we are seeing communities do that. And if you wanted to shoot me a line at uh, mike at americawalks.org, I could share some examples that we've seen out there. Um, but you know, but through with us and our partners, we've seen a number of organizations, you know, kind of getting themselves organized to to do this work. And uh, the the granting programs, you know, are in place until the next transportation reauthorization bill. So uh, there's time to, to, you know, if you miss the last cycle, there's another cycle coming around. Um, I, yeah, I think Mike. Uh, I was going to ask um, how many, uh, how much time you have for Mike to share some great examples here, because I know he has he has plenty. Another area where I would point you, if you're looking for some tangible examples, that you can go to aarp.org/livablemap, and that's going to take you to a map that documents um, the over 800 age-friendly communities and what they are doing and taking action on, as well as the 1400 ARP community challenge grants that I mentioned earlier. And that's searchable. So you can search walk audit. You can search sidewalk improvement. You can search terms like that and get examples of um, projects that have been completed along with pictures and contact information for those organizations um, of uh, kind of that have been completed maybe in a community near you or across the country. That's another place uh, where I would recommend. And as a tactic, I would just um, recommend that kind of going back to starting small, I think doing the kind of engagement and building um, building awareness and bringing folks along is going to help inform those applications to the big grant programs as well as kind of build that public support along the way great thank you um mary o'neill has a question about her community which is a traditional rural with agriculture model that has a recognized multi-season recreation area she asks um, are there any guidance for these areas where roads tend to be windy with no bike path or pad path, where groups of cyclists often compete with farm equipment, walkers, runners, and baby carriages? I guess the challenges are different in urban and rural communities. Do you have any um, advice about that? Mike, I don't know if you want to take that one first, if you encountered that more. I, I have some thoughts to probably add on. So. I've been going first. Mike, why don't you take the lead this one? Yeah, yeah. So for me, I think, you know, the issues are still the same, right? Uh, um, some of the statistics Mike shared earlier about folks being struck by vehicles and pedestrian fatalities. I think for me, concentrating effort in the places where the most people are at the most times is probably a smart strategy. So if that is a kind of county or state road that goes through your community and there goes through a busy um, uh, downtown or connecting to that 
multi-use rec pop uh, recreational area focusing in around those kind of places where you're um where people are gathering where you're hoping to incentivize more walking as a starting place seems like a really good strategy and you know goes without saying i think the um east you know kind of rails to trails network and kind of a lot of the um off-road um or kind of off off-road off highway bike um kind of facilities and bike um the network there i think it can be really valuable knowing that not every community has that but i think starting in those places where you're encouraging people to go you're incentivizing people to go and you know people are to begin to uh, address your walkability and then connecting those kind of in a step-by-step -step way seems to be a kind of a, a great strategy there i'm sure mike has some fantastic insights to add though yeah, I, I think that one of the things is that when you look across, you know, and I'm a fan, I'm a fan of Google Maps, you know, zooming in and zooming out and looking at stuff, you know, you see across the country, even in very rural areas, there's oftentimes that old walkable core yeah. on the downtown. And that's actually one of the places where, you know, we see very high fatalities because what you have is a state highway, oftentimes a pair of state highways crossing right through the middle of a small town, which is in a rural area. And uh, again, they brought those highway design principles in there when really that's a place where people should be slowing down and you should be prioritizing pedestrians. So I, I think when we look at, I, I think the most challenging places are actually, you know, the, the suburban places that are neither urban nor rural in which there isn't you, you know you look for well where's the core and and then just it may have all been built without there ever being any core there at all um and i think those are the most challenging i think it's going to be a huge challenge for this country and that that's why i pulled out those examples of well where do you already have some functions and you know in those retail malls could we could we cite uh, our town hall in those spaces? Could we cite the library in that space? Could we convert some of the parking lot to housing? Um, can, can we create pockets of walkability, even in a very car dependent place? And again, I'm not, this is not gonna be a short term thing, but it would mean like ditching all of the land use rules about parking minimums and single uses in an area and, and really looking to the efficiency. Now, Mike mentioned earlier, one of the questions was around the economic benefits of walkability. There's another economic benefit about mixed uses is it takes a hell of a lot fewer miles of street and pipe and wire to, and sewage line. And trust me, as a mayor, that's really expensive stuff. And if you can have a bunch of taxpayers living in an area supporting that, that, all that infrastructure, that's great. So I think we get a little hung up sometimes in thinking that walkability is an urban issue. I think it's not. Um, I'm going to add one more thing to this. I know we're the walkability organization, but one of the really interesting developments is the e-bike revolution. Because what we're seeing is uh, once people discover the thrill of being able to go a few miles without breaking a sweat on the e-bike, and that turns out to be, I, I think it's going to be a game changer. And you, you we're starting to see this adopted in every land use type because that two to three mile trip on an e-bike is super, you know, it's fun, it's fast. If you start build, if you start using street space for that, um, if that country road has a broader shoulder, if that suburban street converts one of its lanes to protected bike lanes, you know, we may not be able to get everything within walking distance, but I think we're going to see, you know, e-bike, you can certainly get a hell of a lot with, with an e-bike distance. And I'm sorry, I'm carrying on, but there's some communities that have built entire systems with pathways for golf carts and everybody rides around in golf carts because it's just nicer and more pleasant. And um, that's kind of what the e-bike thing is like in a way. So I, I think that there's a, there's a small electric vehicle future for America if we can uh, separate them and give them the space to move around, including the types of dedicated trails Mike was talking about. Um, and I think that can really, really change places. Not sure I hit the heart of your question, but, but I'm actually, <laughs> as daunting as it is to change our places, I think we can make changes in all of our places to support walkability and or active transportation. Yeah, I think you answered that pretty well, and I definitely appreciate the comment about uh, other smaller electric vehicles, such as golf carts and uh, e-bikes, changing the way we think about short-distance trips. Mm -hmm. um, 
along the same lines, I think this question is more geared toward um, Mike Watson, but I think both of you may be able to give some perspective. Is there any information on improving trail and preserve experiences and infrastructures for the senior population specifically? Yeah, so I, I think if I it was cutting out a little bit, but if I heard a question, if I heard the question correctly, it was, is there any information around improving trails um, and access for older adults? Yeah. Um, and in that case, yes, there is. Um, so I mentioned earlier, you can go to aarp.org slash livable, and we have uh, a lot of resources there. I'll, I'll highlight a couple. Um, first of all, there is a toolkit that AARP produced with an organization called 880 Cities, as well as the Trust for Public Land. That is a, um, an audit tool for uh, parks and public spaces, and it's a guide as well to create parks and public spaces for all ages. So this applies to you know, traditional kind of city parks with playgrounds and those amenities, as well as more natural areas and doing that, that type of auditing exercise to identify areas that might be less um, conducive to accessibility. Earlier in my presentation, I showed kind of that slide that was around the challenges of aging in place in the community. And one of the things that I didn't touch on was access to public places. While so in kind of um, urban centers, while seniors represent roughly, you know, 15 to 20 percent of the population, we know from data that they're typically only one percent of, of, of park users. And that's not because older adults don't want to be out in the outdoors and it's not because older adults don't have grandchildren that they want to um, take to the park and push on a swing. It speaks to accessibility, both of the accessibility of features within and accessibility getting to those, which I think ties to the question we just, just responded to in terms of how do you build that network and infrastructure. Um, so that's one resource I would point you to is our parks and public spaces for all ages guide. I'd also again point you to our livable communities map. There you can kind of go in and find um, roughly 50 or so past ARP community challenge grants that we've provided to organizations and rural, urban, and suburban communities across the country to do address that very question, adding accessibility features to recreational areas. And that can be as simple as adding places to sit. It can be, um, it can be even more in terms of uh, uh, changing a trail to add gravel so that it's a little bit easier to walk on or turning a portion of a trail that was gravel into paved um, into paved uh, kind of um, access so that folks of all ages and abilities are able to access amenities. So again, I um, would uh, kind of welcome you to uh, think about that and maybe submit an application to the ARP Community Challenge in January 2024. I think we see a lot of really exciting um, kind of municipal and larger kind of regional work in this area, but also a lot of really cool volunteer-driven initiatives. Um, in, uh, in New Hampshire, there was a grant a couple years ago where uh, a kind of um, a land trust wanted to improve access to a really fantastic nature preserve and um, outdoors area. Um, and so one of the things they identified for a very small grant of roughly you know, $4,000 was to add seating along the trail, but they had a challenge in getting the seats there. So they employed llamas um, from a from a local farm to help haul the uh, haul the wood to build the benches along the trail system. So there's a lot of really creative scrappy solutions here as well as some of the bigger um, more costly um, more costly ones as well. So I, thanks for the question. I happen to live in a neighborhood that's near an old uh, this is near a neighborhood business district that was built up around the streetcar line long disappeared. And I, whenever we, uh, I had always kept, when I was a young man, I bought these beautiful speakers in wood, and I always kept the, the boxes for them, for the move from place to place. And one day my wife saw me taking the boxes to the recycle bin and she went, oh my God, we're never moving again. And I was like, well, why would we? Like we're, we're two blocks from a park, we're two blocks from the park pharmacy, we're two blocks from the grocery store. Like this is like a really great place. Um, and I, one of the things I look at, I, I was visiting my aunt and she was at a nursing home outside of Bennington, Vermont. She's like two miles, two or three miles up a hill. Downtown Bennington's a gorgeous little New England town, but it was completely inaccessible to her. Um, I was at a, a, a conference in Maine, in Biddeford, Maine, which has a fantastic little old town, old mill buildings. 
Their medical centers were all in the medical center part of town, which is where my hotel was too. Long walk from downtown, no transit, surrounded by huge parking lots. Like, what do we need to do to move? And, and we moved our schools out of downtowns too, and our civic institutions. What do we need to do to use our civic investments and our zoning codes to allow for all of those types of things in the core? In particular, and by the way, as a candidate for office, you go to a lot of senior centers. And I've done that in, in Washington. I've also helped people run for office in Massachusetts. And so I've been to a ton of senior centers and some are cited that way, um, you know, or, or assisted living facilities. And I just have to say that the ones that are located near, near places are just so much more desirable, but we prohibit it. We prohibit it either in the use or we prohibit it by uh, requiring so many parking spaces for that type of facility which means that they'll head out for a green field. So I, I would really urge anyone on this, if everybody here has got to become a land use expert to stand toe to toe with the land use experts who've, who, who've given us this system, right? And you got to start advocating for, can we put things within walking distance of each other, in particular, the things that are important to seniors, the disabled, uh, the kids, low income people, and then we can start rebuilding community. I mean, again, I keep coming back to this, man. We need a lot more community here with everything that's going down right now. What's going to save us from the challenges ahead is helping each other. And it's a lot harder to do that if you're not connected to each other in a real way on a day-to-day -day basis. Right. That's a very good point. Well, thank you. Um, I know that Mike Watson has to leave us. So if Mike McGinn is okay fielding the remainder of the questions. Um... Sure, I'll, I, can, I can go <laughs> just before noon. I'll keep going. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. Really, really lovely to be here. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mike. We appreciate your input. Take care. Bye. So, Mike McGinn, um, we've had a theme sort of coming through a lot of the questions, which is how do we convince either DOTs or local planners or the people who make the decisions to invest in infrastructure and planning and all of those things that we talked about that would make it safer and easier for pedestrians and bicyclists to um, share the road um, and get to where they're going safely. Um, how, do, how do we approach that and what are some tips for people who want to try to influence their own community? Yeah, that's a great, great question. And it's it's one that I've, you know, been struggling with by trial and error for years myself. Um, I'll offer a couple of different observations. Um, one is that, you know, in order to get things done in government, um, there are kind of three sectors you should look at. There's There's the public, there are the elected officials, and there are the agency officials. And as you look at each one, you kind of need two out of three to get where you want to go. Um, and, and I even learned that as mayor. There were things I wanted to do as mayor, but the public wasn't there. And my agency folks were like, no, we can't do that. Um, and that would then meant I'd be, you know, really sticking my neck out politically. So for elected officials, they can be moved by public demand. So an element of that is organizing. You have to demonstrate not just the correctness of your cause. Um, as I like to, <laughs> one of my sayings is being right is easy, winning is hard. Um, you have to, you really have to bring together a coalition of people to show the elected officials in particular that there isn't in a lot of public demand for this. We, we tend to see, and I'm, I'm sure everyone's familiar with it, that there's a lot of public outcry um, oftentimes on those road redesigns, even that one I showed you, which was 75th Street in Seattle, in which there had been a tragedy and a call to change the street from the community. There were still members of the community who felt like something was being taken away from them with that safety redesign. They thought it would make driving harder and they protested. Um, sometimes that blowback is extremely powerful. And you know, it's a situation where, you know, you can try to change their minds or you can try to activate the people that agree with you to, to speak up as well. And that from a governor, from an elected official's position really changes the tenor of a conversation when, you, when you're in front of an audience with 
community members taking both sides of an issue. Um, it, it's a very different debate. It's a better debate, by the way, than when um, the when when you're standing in front of a group of people who feel that their you know government is descending in their community to change something. So organizing is very powerful, um, and so really it is talk to other people in your community, even people outside of the active transportation space, have the conversation, find the organization that's already doing the work. The other thing to realize is that there's, um, you can tell I think about this a lot, in, in organizing, um, there's, a, there's a saying of there's two ways of knowing. There's knowing with the head and there's knowing with the heart. And so I probably leaned a little more into the head in my presentation today, right? I showed you the data. I shown the analysis, and that's important to show. But the ways of knowing with the heart are stories and why it matters to you and why it matters to your community and how it changes lives. And you have to use both techniques in speaking to people. I think one of the most effective advocacy organizations around the country right now is Families for Safe Streets. And these are family members of those who are killed by traffic violence. And they can recite the statistics as well as anybody, but when they tell their personal stories of what it has meant to them, that's extraordinarily powerful too. Um, so you have to recognize that people who are unalterably opposed in the public might never change their minds, but there are people in the middle um, who might be change their minds. There are people who are passive supporters who might become active supporters. Um, and there are active supporters who might show up for weekly meetings with a coalition to, to make to really make the change. So, so that's really important. I would say the industry is changing as well. Um, we can see uh, as younger engineers come into the professions and younger planners come into the professions, I think we've seen more openness to this. Um, uh, one of our great partners is NACDO, the National Association of City Traffic Officials, and they've been pushing for more progressive standards um, and we even see in AASHTO, which is the state highway transportation officials, we, we see an openness to new ideas there as well, although there's a lot of, a lot of folks still clinging to the old ideas. I'll make one more comment. I was talking about money. Uh, unfortunately, um, we know the public is with us actually on this. Transportation for America did some polling. I, I invite you to go to their page. Vast majorities of Americans, this is a very broad survey, prefer walking and biking and transit to highway expansion. They would like to see the money go there. Um, but there's powerful economic interests who are used to receiving billions of dollars to build highways, and they still hold sway over state legislatures and city councils. Um, and uh, given their economic and political power of these interests, uh, mere reason is insufficient. Um, organizing uh, becomes essential. But if you look across the country, you see parking minimums being eliminated uh, in town after town. You see more and more uh, efforts to um, remove highways and successful examples of highway removal. We can see more and more open streets that came out of the pandemic, open street response. There's clearly a movement, a growing movement and it's just, you know, you just have to take a look at where, for any individual, where do you sit in the system? And how can you help move one of those sectors, whether the public, elected officials, or agency officials to do more? Um, every little bit helps, and it all starts to add up until you start getting a weight in each one that can actually lead to change. Sorry if that was a long answer, um, but uh, there's no magic solution, but we are seeing the effects of individuals taking the time to have the conversations and bring the stories and bring the real meaning behind this to people. Yeah, I think that's some really good advice for folks and hopefully um, we can keep moving the needle. Um, the next question we have is about sort of countering this notion that uh, walkable streets, walkable and more pedestrian friendly streets are um, trying to eliminate cars completely. Um, I think uh, the question is how do we balance that uh, ability to drive to you know, the next town that might have a better grocery store um, and the ability to walk to your corner store to get a quick ice cream or something like that. Um, 
I think it's, the question is about balance and how do we balance the needs of everybody? Sort of that whole idea of complete streets, right? Yeah, and I think I think the I think we have an exceedingly unbalanced system right now, right, in which you almost have to have a car to fully participate in the life of a community. And that's that's unbalanced because it excludes, as we've said, 30% of the population right off the bat, and there's tremendous collateral damage. And and honestly, I, I haven't heard anybody proposing to close uh, the the close the streets that connect one town to another, right? That's just not that's not on the table. We do see pedestrian cores developing, and and I think that's a good thing. Um, and but that doesn't that doesn't prevent the uh, travel from place to place. Um, if we see some of these pedestrian cores, and if we go back, you know. Streets were places where kids used to play. Streets were places where all uses were present. So I, I, I think that sometimes that this, you know, kind of the war on cars type of narrative that people get, that, 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 that trying to make it safe for people to get from place to place to allow more people in the community to enjoy the benefits of the community, that's, that's not about uh, attacking cars. That's about creating a community that works for everyone. And I think that's the place that, personally, I think that's the place that advocates should stay in, is is make their case about what they're for. Um, I, I have not yet seen, um, I've not yet seen anybody disconnect the road network in a way that people can't drive. But we have sidewalk networks that are disconnected. We have bike networks that are disconnected. We have transit networks that are disconnected. And what we're looking for is to try to create the complete networks for for people outside of vehicles that we've completed for those in vehicles. And, and that's the balance we're striving towards. Yeah. Well said. Um, can you give us some examples, if you know of any, of where uh, local governments or states are requiring sidewalks and bike lanes in a specific way as a part of the development process as new development comes online? You know, uh, there's a concern that um, as if developers do it, um, there won't be consistency and there will be sidewalks that end and don't go anywhere. Yeah, no, I think that that's a really huge issue. And, and part of it is, and it's one we we're gonna have to uh, take head on, I think, and it, it may be the next step and maybe one of the next big steps in the movement. In most places across the country, sidewalks are viewed as a, a property owner responsibility. Um, both for maintenance and for installation, and and the questioner, you know, has probably seen those places, and I've, there are places like that. I've seen these too, where a new development, some new developments are required to build a sidewalk, and some are not because they're small, and, and don't trigger the requirement. So you so you don't get a full network, and the government says it's not our job to build the sidewalk. Um, there are there is there there is complete streets legislation in many cities and states. Um, the Complete Streets Movement has been very successful, but the implementation often runs up against that uh, uh, you know, assumption that it, that's not really, the, a new sidewalk is not the responsibility of the city or the, st or the county or the state, it's the responsibility of the property owner. Um, so the implementation can be spotty as well. Denver, Colorado uh, uh, had a, a citizen-led ballot measure, um, which led to uh, sidewalks only and that the city would take responsibility. So I think this is a really big policy shift and we're not, you know, we're not seeing many places do it, but that sidewalks should be the responsibility like roads um, of, of, the, of the government and need to be funded. I mean, nobody uh, walks on their sidewalk from their property, from one end of their property line to the other and back again. The sidewalk is meant to be a network, um, just like the just like the roadways. Um, so I don't think there's any place that is successful in getting a complete network by relying solely on property owners. And, and even the places that say it's property owner responsibility, in fact, make investments in sidewalks in specific places when there's sufficient public demand for it. So it's uh, we need to you know build that public demand and change the paradigm of who's responsible for sidewalks in the first place. Well said. 
Well, we're nearing the end and I'm going to ask a concluding question, which we asked at the end of our last webinar. Um, how do you maintain your sense of optimism and hope for the future that things will continue to get better? You know, that's such a, you know, I, I haven't gotten that question in a while and I always respond to it. Uh, I, I, for me, I feel more of a sense of duty. That's what drives me, if, if that makes sense. Like, I mm -hmm. feel like I have a duty to my kids and their kids one day um, and to all the other kids in the community. I have a duty to my neighbors as well. And um, so I, that, that I believe tends to drive me more, that, that we're all connected to each other. And the one thing that um, we take away at the end of the day is, is how we helped each other and our relationships um, with each other. So uh, I guess I, I gave you reasons for hope earlier. There is a movement. It is changing. Mm -hmm. I give you many reasons for hopelessness. We have seen deaths go up. Um, and we, have, we, we understand the issues of uh, inequity and climate and, and health challenges in our country, and they are significant. Um, but I think I, I said there's a sense of duty for me, but also a sense of reward. The most rewarding stuff I've ever done is working with other people to make the community better. And uh, th that just always keeps me coming back. And one of the things I regret about this job is up at a national level, I don't get to be hands on around a table with a bunch of people about how are we going to change this or how are we going to change that. Right. Uh, I miss that a little bit. I'm jealous of all of you who are plotting and scheming how to create some change in your community uh, because I think that's the most rewarding thing. So that's what feeds me. A sense of it's the right thing to do and that it's a rewarding thing to work with others to make a community better. Well, that's the perfect note to end on. Thank you so much for your time today and all of your great insights on these issues. Oh, thank um, you. You're very kind. And thank you to everybody who stuck with us through all of this. Yes, thank you. So this concludes our first 2023 walk in art. I would like to offer our deepest gratitude to Mike McGinn and Mike Watson for their presentations and for such an engaging discussion. Thank you to everyone who attended today. And again, I apologize for the technical issues we had in the beginning, and we will fix the issue with the welcome video for the next webinar. Um, the complete recording of today's webinar will be posted online soon. And when you exit today's webinar, you will be asked to participate in a short evaluation. Please take a few moments to provide your feedback so that we can improve the webinar experience. All attendees will also receive an email that will contain a link to a personalized certificate of participation that can be used to claim other continuing education credits. Keep an eye on your email box for details about future webinars, including our next webinar on pedestrian infrastructure and safety next Thursday, October 12th at 10.30 a.m. Eastern Time with speakers Edward Airport from Strong Towns, Wesley Mitchell and Catherine Hundley from WSP USA who will share their experiences with a specific Baltimore case study. We hope you can join us next week. Have a great day. Thank you very much.